Good morning, everyone. Yeah, don't, don't use that. Uh, we're going to start our session. Yeah, but I'm also really good now. Uh, so you might session... want to change where you're facing. Cool. So the second yeah, is uh, how to survive your rookie year, uh, because this is our second year doing FTC. Uh, so we wanted to give you guys some tips on how to not freak out. Who's a rookie? Raise your hands. Okay, good. You can be right place. Cool. So, who we are? Uh, we were in FLL for two years as Team 58. Uh, this is our second year of FTC, like I mentioned before. Uh, we're an all-girl team with eight girls, and we also have four mentors. And we're working with Girl Scouts of Western Washington so that they also can sponsor FTC teams of all girls, which they only sponsor FLL teams until this year. Yeah, and we're Team 11104 Bearded Pineapples. My name is Madeline. I mean, we program our robot and Prowl on Reddit. Um, my name is Fritzy, and I kind of do a little bit of everything, but I do a lot of notebooking. Yes. So, competition day. So, uh, there's a lot of politics in being picked in the game. I don't know how much you guys have read on the uh, game manual part one and two on how it works, um, but generally, you're going to want to do some scouting so that you know what the other teams can do, um, so that you know what would be an asset to your team's uh, abilities. And if you have if you have no idea what this means, if you uh, there's elimination matches that are played, and then given all the points that you've accum accumulated from that, there's an alliance selection where the top usually four teams get to pick who's going to be on their alliance with them. They pick three other teams, and this is when you really need to get to know the other teams and get to know their robots, see if you can work well to them. There's some scout scouting happening right there, so that because uh, people people don't know you, then they can't pick you. What's also good is to have a diagram of the field showing with arrows where your robot goes on the field so that it's a visual for other teams to see as well, so that you're not going to run into each other in autonomous or something. Yeah, and you can do this by, there's various websites, FTC stats, uh, the Orange Alliance, there's lots of these where you can see um, kind of quantitative data about teams from different, uh, uh, from different competitions. But oftentimes it's much more helpful to just walk over to their pits and competitions and talk with the team, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And if you have a larger team, you can also have people watch the matches day of to see, hmm, well, did their, did their lifter actually work? Did, did it grab? Are they doing the exact same thing? Would that have issues with our robot? Things like that. It's also good to just meet teams at all sorts of events, do scrimmages, uh, get to know other teams. Uh, there's also, which is not, ex uh, if you come from FLL, you probably wouldn't expect this, but in FTC, there are robots that are going to try and run into you or prevent you from getting places. It's kind of less likely this year because they've kind of tightened up the rules, but it might be applicable in following years. Yeah, so you should always be prepared to be, um, uh, obviously you shouldn't be planning on doing uh, aggressive driving, right? But you, there's always some robot that goes haywire or something like that or chocks out and starts going crazy. So you should, your robot shouldn't be so flimsy that uh, if it's bumped it breaks because it won't succeed in competition then. So um, there's different events, right? Different levels of play. And so uh, at all of these events, there's a ranking based on uh, the different kinds of points that you earn. And your ranking can change dramatically depending on if you had a really good match or if you had a not so good match or maybe your, um, your phone crashed during that match. So we've gone from second to 15th in between month and one match. So yes, uh, your rank, you can pay attention to it, but it's not actually all that helpful as a number. But that also means then that uh, paying attention to the rank of other teams on stat websites is also not that, not that great of a number. And it's also good to incorporate these different events in your strategy, like you can say, by the first league event, we want to be able to do this. By the second, we want to be able to do even more. So that you know exactly how you have it planned out. Exactly. That kind of gives you some deadlines and timelines to work around. Uh, so there's a couple social media sites where robotics teams are a lot more active than others. Uh, YouTube is great for general inspiration. Teams do robot in three days or robot reveal videos or CAD tutorials. Good to learn. Um, and uh, Reddit, there's an FTC Reddit, reddit.com slash r slash FTC. And there's discussion on rules, on mechanisms, on teams, how teams are organized, on the engineering notebook, on defensive play strategies. Uh, there's a lot of activity on that. And if you have a super specific question, people will generally answer that. Or if you're like, help, I need help, I need help with my mechan mechanism wheel code, 
it's not working, you put a link to your GitHub and people will immediately start helping you with that. So that's a great resource. Uh, Twitter seems to be the most popular social media. There are also teams on Instagram and on Facebook, but Twitter is really where I found the most teams. Yeah, and there, uh, you know, you can play funny games like this. This, uh, if you looked at last year's game, Velocity Vortex, this would have uh, given you a lot of penalties. You were kind of having fun with that. But, um, yeah, that's where you can see, uh, get ideas for outreach events, see, what, see other people's progress, stuff like that. There's also a Discord. It's still in the early stages, so there's a lot of uh, people talking about other stuff besides FTC. But if you have gamers on the team, it might be a good choice for you. Yeah, the density, the density of helpful information, I'd say, is highest on Reddit, and it's increasing slowly on Discord, but it's not quite there yet. And um, uh, there's some teams on Facebook and Instagram, and it, if they're on them, then you can direct message, message them too, but the others are generally better. So when we first started FTC, there's a lot of materials that you generally wouldn't find in some of these other online store like Tetrix. Um, so one example is like dual lock and Velcro, which we actually use to mount our phones and some of our hardware, uh, some of our uh, electronic components onto the hardware of our robot. If you haven't done FOL, dual lock is basically plastic Velcro that yeah that you stick the mission models onto the field down with, and that is actually very was very helpful. And uh, for example, this polyurethane belting here, the you can't see that the red stuff. Um, we actually saw that here. Uh, we came to this workshop last year and saw it in. Um, Redshift's uh, workspace, which is very cool, and then we got we ended up using that on our intake mechanism. Uh, there's also surgical tubing, it's the yellow stuff on the screen. Uh, it's like a uh, rubber band, I guess. Um, yeah, it's very stretchy. You can use it great for fingers or things like that. We used it to, um, uh, we had two uh, s spinning flywheels to shoot our wiffle balls, and we used it to make sure that they, uh, that, that, that there was tension between them, actually. We use it like a conveyor belt. Exactly. And we used acrylic for our side shields as well. And we also 3D printed our phone case and I believe another component. And uh, you can use your laser cutter to laser cut prototypes or things like that. And if you are like, what, what are these machines? We don't have access to these. You can um, oftentimes uh, large companies will have uh, maker spaces that uh, if you know an employee you can use. Google and Microsoft will definitely give their uh, employees access to maker spaces. And also I, I believe uh, there's also Swerve um, in Woodenville that you can also, and also if you reach out to a lot of engineering companies or uh, metal workshops or places like that, people are more than likely to give you help. So when we started, we were like, well, you can use a kit, but you can pretty much use anything you want. Where on, where on earth do we buy all this stuff? So um, It's normal to keep ordering parts. When we were uh, doing last year's season, we were ordering parts almost every single week. Even though at the beginning we were kind of shy about ordering parts, we really started ordering a lot of parts. Um, there's all sorts of sites you can order from for different things. Yeah, um, Rev this year, that's where you'll probably be getting your expansion hub, which will be the electronics, right? Uh, Vex and Acrobotics both offer kit parts. Um, uh, Digikey and Adaf Adafruit are really good for finding specific electronics parts if you want them. Uh, Andy Mark will sell a lot of your wheels, and of course you can find a lot of stuff on Amazon. Outreach. So uh, it's important that when you're doing outreach, you really know who you're trying to target with your outreach. You don't just want to stand there and show your robot and tell people about the program. You really want to make sure that they know how to get to the program if they're interested. Um, so it's also good to reach out to other teams to join you, so you could possibly play matches with other teams, uh, better visual than just one robot. Yes, and um, so when we mean by think about your target demographic, so this is a photo from Seafair recently, and you can't see it, but in the shade back there, there's several FRC teams, so huge robots and uh, another FTC team including us hack. And this was uh, an event organized by First Washington and they had, this was a tent at Seafair, so they had, you know, just normal people coming to Seafair that would walk through and they would get to see these robots and drive some other ones. But then we also had um, superintendents from a lot of uh, Washington school districts that don't have uh, FIRST Robotics at their schools yet. 
come through. And so it's na you're naturally going to talk to a superintendent differently who's probably more interested in uh, how this kind of project-based learning is going to affect their classroom and their students and how you're going to fund this than you're going to um, a five-year-old passerby who's interested just in your robot, that kind of thing. So you really have to think about who you're talking to in general. Uh, opportunities. So make sure that you just jump at all opportunities that are available. Oftentimes, uh, if somebody's like sending out an email asking for teams to do outreach with, uh, they're not going to wait that long for you to respond. Other teams are also going to want this opportunity, so you want to respond yeah. right away. And this is where we uh, were able to kind of net network with a lot of teams. So this is a photo here from a scrimmage before Super Regional. So we're this team here. Uh, we were not going to Super Regionals, but everybody else was. But we were invited as well to help team scrimmage. So that was a really fun event, and people talked about their notebooks and everything. So um, even if it's you know not completely applicable to you, you should still go because you can always learn a lot, and it's always great to know for the next. Uh, ESD uh, or electrostatic discharge. It's a high voltage discharge. Um, and when since these, all of these electronics on the robot have small components, the small shocks can vaporize part of the material, which is a problem when you're trying to run your robot on a field. It's like if you've ever gone down a plastic slide on a, um, on a playground, and then you stand up, and then you poke somebody, and you shock them. It's like a mini lightning bolt. Well, this can happen with your robot, too. And if you're not careful, then it'll just fry your robot, and you'll be sitting there, and you can't do anything. This happened, this has happened right there, hence the look of disappointment. We had uh, at our first interleague event, it was pretty bad, and our robot basically never lasted the entire match because at some point it would black out, and the Wi Fi connection between the two phones would fail, and the robot was just kind of sitting there and it couldn't move. Yeah, but we later fixed it, and there's another photo where I am literally levitating. I'm so excited. So, and um, so th this was more of an issue last year because of the modern robotics electronics, which were, there was tons of separate modules all connected by USB. And if, if you don't know this, USB is not great for this because you have to 3D print your own protector so that uh, all the USB cables stay in place. And tips you could do, uh, things. That, but this year, the Rev expansion hub, there's really only one USB cable from the hub to the phone. So that should help things a lot. Another thing you can do is you can... Uh, you can make sure that all of your um, that all of your uh, wiring is secure and that it's not uh, mounted on conductive surfaces. You can mount things on wood. You can make sure to 3D 3D print little um, protection gaskets, I guess, for all of the ports. Uh, there's also some less conventional methods, like uh, using uh, it's called like uh, anti-static spray, like uh, staticide or uh, dryer sheets to just like spray it on your robot or rub it on your robot's wheels. Uh, which that generally helps. Kind of helped. And then another thing you can do. I uh, also um, uh, ESD gets worse in colder places. So if you can keep where you work colder, then uh, that will um, you know you'll be able to practice in worse conditions. This is actually a bigger issue in Washington than other places because our state championship is held on an ice hockey rink. So that's uh, I that I hypothesize that that's why uh, Washington teams generally seem to have more ESD problems. To others. Oh, well, how to avoid them. I kind of just mentioned that. But as you can see here, we have uh, wooden side shields right there. Um, what kinds of wheels you have will, gener will, ge uh, will also make ESD better or worse. Um, you can also use electric tape to cover exposed metal so that it doesn't conduct. Yeah. And yeah, just keeping your cables neat, that helps you with all dimensions all the time because uh, yeah, if you can quickly identify where your uh, wire is loose. Oh, then, it also says that yeah. we hope ESD will not be a problem, but we had an outreach event yesterday, and every single time we touched the robot, it did shock us, so it might be a problem. Yeah, but that might also be a problem with our system and not with that. So ESD is always a problem, but you can try to make it uh, less of a problem. Okay, good. Yeah. If you're feeling overwhelmed, because it's your rookie year, and you're like, these people are here. They're talking to me about things that I have no idea about. Help. Uh, Kanban is a really great way to organize your team. Uh, this is our revised Kanban board. It's like our second or third version. Uh, so we have all sorts of columns. We have in progress, uh, it's right there, um, backlog, long term, and short term. Uh, things that need to be notebook, uh, testing column, tracking column, and done column. So you can kind of move the stickies and they kind of move around the board until they go to done. So. Uh, yeah, every sticky here is a task, and if you can see at the see at the bottom there, 
we have uh, different color-coded stickies for different for different sections, so for outreach and for control components and for design. So that's kind of how to group them. And the way that a sticky moves across our board is that it'll start either in the dream log, so that's where you know some of our more ridiculous ideas go, but it'll start in that uh, three sticky wide column, which is the short-term backlog. So that's like, I don't know, apply to that PTC grant or connect the two rev hubs together. And then we'll start every meeting by deciding, okay, do we need to write more stickies? And, or do we just need to move stickies over into the in progress column? And once something has been completed, then it immediately goes to, to notebook, which means that we need to write, document what we've done in the notebook. You can tell that's kind of full right now, we're a little behind. But, and then once that's done, it goes to the done column on the far right. And then that, uh, that column full of yellow stickies right there is in track. So like we contacted somebody, but they haven't gotten back to us, or we've ordered these LEDs, but they haven't been shipped yet. This like is that. great because you're not going to forget your tasks, they're on the board. Yeah. And it's also pretty gratifying to uh, move a sticky to the done hole. Your team identity. So your team identity can help you win, motivate, and it also makes you memorable just in general, not just for judging, but also for outreach. Your team will recognize you, they're going to want to uh, invite you to an out outreach events, which good. Uh, also, it's going to make you more likely to be picked at competitions, and our logo is pretty recognizable. Yeah, uh, you're not going to walk away from today thinking, hmm, what was the name of that team again? No, they were the creepy bearded fruit people. Yes, you're going to remember that. So also, <laughs> at these big competitions, there's, uh, there's, these, there's these pits. So every team has a, a table about half of, half of the size of these, and for example, at state, there could be, I don't know, like maybe 30 of these, and then there's all the FLL people, and so when the judges come, when judges come through and they want to give you pit interviews and they want to talk to you at your table, they don't want to have to wade through a sea of black shirts where they all say like cyber and shock and robo because that's like all the pop all the popular team name prefixes. They want to be able to find that team immediately because that speeds up the entire process. So you can have a banner or I don't know giant flashing lights or just make yourself memorable. And it, uh, that's another thing that makes first very fun. I mean, you'll know this if you're in FL. There's a huge uh, Team spirit is very important. So these are some of the examples of some of the memorable things that we have. We have the leggings, which I have not seen any other team do. Uh, we keep our color coding the same on our pineapple, and we have some other weird uh, online store products that we're working on. Yeah, and so uh, those those are buttons. We give we can give out buttons at competitions. You'll see this more at higher competitions rather than at your first qualifiers. We give out stickers, temporary tattoos. All of these things that help people remember you. And uh, yeah, we, we're also very into, so this is our base pineapple. We're also into designing different versions of our pineapples. We currently have an Indiana Jones one for relic recovery. And I believe another team on Twitter made us a Santa one at some point. Yeah, so. Uh, so a good way to stay on top of the notebook, kind of funny for telling you guys this, but uh, make sure you establish a daily routine. Um, having it on your Kanban board is a good idea. And when you finish it, like just plan out the last 15 minutes, set a timer. Uh, tell everybody the last 15 minutes just to sit down and do their notebook entry. Um, and make sure that when you do notebook, explain why and how you did it and not just what you did. Yeah, and another thing with the notebook is that you'll see some examples online. You'll see handwritten notebooks. You'll see uh, really beautiful printed ones. You'll see really, really long ones. You'll see much more concise ones. So basically, just find the easiest system that works for your team. If your team doesn't want to have to mess with Word templates and everything, or OneNote, or Google Docs or something, get a physical notebook. And the most important thing is that you write in it every meeting. You write what you did. You write all the math that you did. If you did something in CAD, you print it out. Uh, you print out your code. You put it in. If the content in this stage is really more important. When you then do uh, FTC in your later years, you can refine. You can refine this process. There's more more. also a notebook session during the third uh, third session, so you can definitely go to that to learn more about the notebook. Yeah. So uh, our new uh, our rookie year, so last year we had a um, a daily log notebook where we wrote everything by hand, but then we decided that having um, everything in chronological order was really difficult for the judges to use. Because if you wanted to figure out um, how does their lift work, then you'd have to go to the table of contents. You'd have to find it. It just it wasn't that great. So we um, then uh, typed up nice versions, nice, I uh, guess, essays describing everything that fit into each of the categories. Very sectioned out into different categories. It made it really easy to scan on the page to find what you needed. Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, and include lots of pictures and diagrams, walls of text are not fun. Uh, yeah. Other, yeah, so uh, don't worry if you get a little bit behind on your notebooking, but don't let it compound. If you're three or four meetings behind, it's you're going to have trouble remembering why you did something. It's going to be harder to reflect on why, why you did what. It'll be harder to find that exact photo of the mechanism at that state. So just stay on top of your notebooking. And so, see, here's an example of what we did during um, the, these essays, right? Essays, I guess. So we had a section on our team, so that's team identity, who our mentors are, um, things like that, why we call our robot its name, uh, the business plan, so our sustainability, how we're funded, working with Girl Scouts, experiences and lessons weren't we added this, so that's okay. After Interlude, we had lots of issues with ESPs. We spent like a month working on mounting our electronics better and everything like that. Physical robot, and then software. So, another example. Uh, first is more than robots. Uh, you hear this re uh, repeated a lot, but it really is. Uh, there's lots of stuff you can do. You can do a first parody video. Uh, they do that. They've been doing that for the last three years now. You can take a song and write a parody of it related to the robots. Uh, you can do a first like a girl video. We just did this uh, during the off season, where we talked about how we first like a girl, talking about how as a girl team we do first. Yep, that's a Twitter. That's, that was a Twitter campaign that went around. And you can help other teams, you can help other teams both remotely, you can Skype with teams, you can meet with teams, you can help teams on Reddit, you can do uh, things like that, you can scrimmage with teams, and you can uh, um, meet with another team and get a tour of their workshop, which is actually pretty cool to see other teams do that. So here, uh, this is from our YouTube channel, so there's the Compass Award where you are highlighting a mentor that you have. So uh, yeah, uh, that was from State. And then, um, this is our last year's song parody. Uh, we haven't made a new one yet. There's first Like a Girl, and then we always take video of our competitions. Uh, not point of view from the robot, but videos of the matches, and then generally uh, put that up as well. Uh, Kat, so this is mostly a good thing to learn in your rookie year, but you're probably not going to be using it to design a lot in your rookie year. We use CAD uh, to design adding a big component because we added it much later after we already built big parts of our robot. Um, but mostly you want to CAD after you build your robot. Mm -hmm. It's good to have in your engineering notebook. It uh, helps you win a PTC design award. Um, and it's mostly just good to have in your tool belt for next year. The other thing is that um, CAD, so computer-aided design, has a pretty steep, uh, pretty steep learning curve if you don't have a mentor uh, who's experienced with it. So this is a great place, like, in the Connect Award category, where you could um, contact some local engineering engineering companies and ask if they'd have somebody willing to walk you through or teach you how to use CAT. If you don't want to do that, there's tons of online tutorials. You can ask other teams on social media and like that. But for example, last year we mainly, we mainly used it as a documentation tool, so showing the state of our robot after meetings. But even though we were pretty much just doing physical prototyping, and again, trying to see if something fits, but in the off-season, we've been working on machining our own drive base, so all of the design for that was done in CAD, so we're kind of making the jump from using this as a documentation tool to using it as a design tool. Uh, collaborative tools, this is good for team communication. We use Slack, personally, we, we like this because you have different channels, and uh, so it also helps us coordinate our meetings, because then our parents don't have to coordinate meetings, because we're... Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so this uh, Slack, everybody has access to it, and we, um, you know, there's specific specific channels for um, scheduling and <coughs> to-do stickies that people think of, or for all the photos that need to go in the notebook but are on people's phones, things it's like also that. Also good if you have a digital notebook, especially, but just in files in general, you're probably not going to handwrite everything you do. So you want to have a OneDrive or a Dropbox that everyone has access to. Yes, for sorting all of your files. Moving things is the worst. Now, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, how would you get access to like, the Discord thing? The Discord. Um, on what? Reddit, there's a thread on the subreddit, uh, the FTC subreddit, and it has... Uh, there's a join link uh, on it, but I, yeah, you can, you can search for that on the Reddit, I think, yeah. Uh, so we, so far, we're using uh, Trello, mm -hmm. which is uh, online Kanban, right? Yeah, it's an, yeah, it's an online backlog, 
and it's been working out really well for us. And what do you guys think of Trello? Uh, I pers our team personally doesn't have experience using Trello. We we just kind of decided to use the physical the physical version. Mm -hmm. But you know there are issues when we turn on the shop vac to clean up a uh, uh, aluminum aluminum dust. You know sometimes all the stickies fly off the board, mm -hmm. things like that. But I, I imagine that that could be very helpful for linking documents or assigning tasks to people. So that allows you more degrees of complexity in your board. But yes. I personally think it doesn't really matter what you use. It's that you use it and that you use it effectively. But so if you found, got Trello working for you, then that's great. If you can if you can use it and stick with it. Other questions? Yeah. What CAD program do you guys have? So uh, we use PDC Creo, but that is solely based on the fact that we have a uh, mechanical engineering mentor who's experienced with Creo, who could uh, help us help us use it. It's um, you could use SolidWorks, you could use Inventor. There's um, there's, there's tons of different ones you can use. It's, I would say, pick it based on how you can learn it. If you can find somebody to help teach it to you or find tutorials on it. Yeah. Um, our team's programmers are uh, fairly inexperienced. What can we do to change that? Or like, how can we uh, help ourselves to do better without uh, taking out uh, our, our club's other team's time? So uh, for that, um, so are you talking about like Java experience or yeah, complete Java. programming experience in general? Well, Java. Just Java. Java. What so, you can do yeah. is you can have separate meetings for just the programmers if you're willing to schedule extra meetings. Um, do you have a programming mentor? Or, yes. Yes. So there, um, it, uh, that's where you'll want to word it as quickly as possible. But again, if you don't have uh, mentors with that kind of technical experience, that's great where you can uh, contact a company or contact a university for uh, somebody uh, helping to be willing to teach you or if you need to work version control. But basically, um, I would say uh, don't say your set. Um, you can see if you have you dealt, you have the FTC SDK already, we have all the example yeah. programs. You can mess with all of those. You can kind of see how things start to work. And uh, learning the syntax and basic object-oriented programming from your mentor then is the process. So I would say think more long-term. Think about how your still skills are going to compound for next year and how you can work during the off-season. But your goal should be probably to have intuitive teleop controls for your robot in the beginning then. There's and also a couple of videos on YouTube that you can look at. Um, and something that we forgot to mention, this might be harder if you're a school team, but we actually meet throughout all of the year. Even when we've done our last competition for that season, we keep working because we want to keep learning more, uh, keep learning more programming, or start on our new drive base since we're doing a mechanism drive base this year. Yeah, but that's easier because we meet in somebody's garage. But if you're working out of a school where you know you can't go in on weekends, then uh, you're in a more of a pickle. Then. Other questions? Yeah. Can you repeat that? How did you decorate your pit? Oh, our pit. So. Um, we didn't, we, uh, when we were reflecting on this at the end of the season, we thought we could have improved a bit, so we've, uh, we've dedicated a whole person in charge of our competition day, like, pit crew design kind of thing. Uh, but, what we did yeah. last year was we had a big banner, and otherwise it was kind of a mess because all of our bags were spilling out from under the table. So we really want to improve that this year. Yeah, so we have uh, somebody who's, you know, we've already ordered our stickers and our buttons and things like that, and it's... It's mainly having an organized pit where you can, when your battery dies, can you come fix it? When that one USB cable comes, can you find that other OTG cable that you need? Or can you ask another team for it? But it's mainly being organized, and so also when judges and other teams come, if it's a giant pile of Dorito bags and jackets, then nobody really wants to come into your pit, so it's basically making it um, accessible and kind of organized, which we didn't do such a great job of last year, but we're trying to improve this year. Other questions? Uh, this year we're ordering from Sticker Mule, I think. Yeah. Um, our, uh, but we also used Sticker U and. Um, Twenty five wristbands was another one. Yeah, that's where we got our buttons. Uh, you can also just like look up um, custom buttons or something. Uh, we ordered our shirts from Custom Ink. Yeah. Uh, but it it's just it just kind of depends on the on the quantity that you need and what size. What, what company do you want to go with for that? <coughs> Other questions? Yeah? 
Um, do you have some criteria for a team member to participate in a competition? Like you to test, make sure everyone knows the rules? No, um, we will, don't. No? Because uh, we have a generally, I think we have a pretty involved team. So that hasn't really been a problem for us. Um, we really want everyone to enjoy it and not just have it feel stressful. So our so um, FTC teams I think can go in size from like three to fifteen people. Um, so we have eight people, so it's kind of in the middle, right? So uh, our basic so we have some people that are there at every meeting. They schedule extra meetings, everything like that. That are uh, super dedicated. We have some people that are super involved in dance or art or other things that can't come to all the meetings. But um, basically, the idea is when you're at the meeting, you're putting all all of your effort in. You're contributing to what you can. If um, maybe you want to learn CAD, then you start learning that. Or if you want to use your art skills to make new logos, things like that. It's applying the skills that you have and de developing new skills and just uh, making the most of your time. So we, it's not that everybody has to be there all the time, but that when you're there, you're contributing. So um, yeah, we haven't we haven't had a uh, a cutoff point like you didn't show up, you can't go to competitions. That not that's not really how we felt like we should operate. But if that works for you, then I guess that's good. What we also did this year, uh, after doing all of last year's uh, realizing what everybody liked to do on the team, this year we did kind of do some assigned roles, which is just making sure that those certain tasks get done and certain people are held accountable for those tasks to make sure everything really does get done. Yeah, at the beginning of our rookie year, we intentionally didn't say, okay, you're the programmer, you're the CAD person, because we didn't know who liked to do what. So we kind of let people experiment, and people kind of found their spots and what they enjoy. So now we can officially give people name badges like, you're the CAD person, things like that. And that also means that um, we, when each person had responsibilities, it's their responsibility that everything is documented, that it's ready for the competition. So it just kind of depends on how you want to structure your team. That depends on if you have multiple teams operating out of a single school, or if you're just one lone team oper operating out of a garage, how big it is, things like that. Questions? So, can you see, I think the rookie year, there's a lot of expense on all the parts. After that, maybe you can reuse some tools and stuff. So, can you give me an idea, like, how much do you spend for the So, uh, as a team, we do spend, uh, I think, a lot more than we necessarily would need to. Um, I think we spent, was it like $3,000? So, so Last like, year, Total to nine thousand. Okay, completely off. Our financial manager isn't here. Um, so for all sorts yeah. of stuff, um, our lift was pretty expensive, I think, because we brought like was that the lift itself was three thousand um, dollars for parts that we had to buy, and then um, we also did buy like our nice shirts. Uh, they were not super cheap shirts. Uh, we also bought a lot of buttons and stickers, so all that adds yeah. to the cost. We did pay for some team dinners. Um, so. Yeah, but the other thing is we're, we are a team are uh, quite financially well off, but it's also we're used because um, most of our funding comes through uh, Microsoft volunteer hours. So, but that means that we are free to, um, you know, we tested using the Actibotics kits. We had to spend the money on that. We could get the full field. But the thing that we've been doing with that is talking with Girl Scouts to tell them, okay, you're starting up a team very limited budget, what are the things that you need to buy? Okay, don't get the most expensive t-shirts, but definitely do get this um, do get this chain breakers. We were kind of testing a whole bunch of parts for Girl Scouts. And another thing you can do is apply for grants and sponsorships. That would be up on the First Washington website. Uh, and uh, you can also um, look in, let's say that you wanted to uh, fabricate your own parts, maybe that's in future years, but you could look into a partnership with a uh, metal yard or with a water jetting company, so maybe they'll help you pay for some of the equipment and the labor. So it's, uh, and you can also do fundraising going around to uh, local companies and say, okay, if you give us this much money, you'll go up on our um, banner, things like that. And there's a talk on fundraising being given today, too. Uh, also, we made a list for Girl Scouts with all the prices of everything that we thought they would need uh, for their new teams, uh, which didn't really include uh, certain parts if you're going to build like a big lift mechanism. Uh, I think it's on our website, and if not, I'm going to put it there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we we were not very frugal, but we also didn't have to be because uh, because of we were very very luck, luck, lucky to be uh, financially well off in that sense. But we tried to then give that the dollars that we had accumulated to Girl Scouts and things like that. Other questions?
Uh, yeah, beardedpineapples.weebly.com. Beardedpineapples.com automatically redirects you there. Oh, cool. Anything else? <coughs> okay, did you talk about um, the competition? I was a little, little bit sorry. Yes, oh, I we did talk about competition. <laughs> And we were also planning on putting this presentation on our website, so if you missed anything, you didn't like get down all the list of all the different websites you can order from. Here. So for the competition day, we mainly talked about um, networking with other teams for the alliance selection. You know, teams can't pick you in the alliance selection if they don't know that you know that you exist. So you have to be very open with teams and uh, talk to them and maybe. Um, uh, go on their website before the competitions and go to outreach events so that you, so that you know what the teams are. And um, if you're coming from FLL, you have to uh, understand that there is robot-to-robot -robot contact. You have to have a pretty stable robot. And that uh, the quantitative data from ranking and qualification points and things like that isn't always the best measure of a team. It's really a good idea to go and talk to a team and see and you know watch their matches and see how your robot would work with their robot if you're on an alliance. And yeah, that was it. I think uh, the last thing, uh, I like this team on the day of the match, right? Who's team? The, the last thing, the I like this team on the day of the match. Yes, it's yes, they do. Problem. So there's um, so there's a uh, qualify. The way that this works is you'll go to two scrimmage events in your league, and there you'll just be accumulating points. So you'll be playing like six or seven matches, and then you'll go to your interleague competition, where you'll start off, you'll be playing um, uh, qualification matches with other teams. These are the alliances are randomly assigned, and then uh, all of the points um, that you've earned that day will be going into a ranking. And the top four teams, they are then the alliance captains, and they get to, choose, they get to invite other teams to be on their final alliance for the final bracket. So this is an interleague? Yes, this is an interleague, which will be mid-December this year. Okay. So the first two <laughs> are just... Uh, the scrimmages within your league. That's yeah. like within a group of six to ten teams. That but the qualification points count. Yes, but they do count. But there's uh, but there's no judging. Oh. That, so. Yeah, judging is only at interleague, which would be your third event. And it's going to be, for our uh, league, it's like... Uh, in December, <coughs> yes. right, no, the, the, winter break. But. All the interleagues will be on either December 16th or the 17th. Can you give some examples of how the qualifying points will be used in the interleague? So, this can, you can, all of the specifics of how the points work can be found in Game Manual Part 1. And um, so, I, if I remember how this works correctly, is so if you, you get a certain number of points, whether you uh, win, win, lose, or tie a match, you get, um, then you get the number of points that the, uh, uh, if you won, you get the number of points that the losing a lot, that the other alliance had. The idea is you get more points if you played against a tougher team than if you uh, beat an easier team. Actually, I think right? that's, um, there's, there's ranking points and there's qualification points, and qualification points, I think it's like, you can get just a certain number of points for losing, winning, or tying. Mm -hmm. But then there's also like the ranking points, and that's where you get the uh, the losing team's points added to your score if you win. Yeah, and all of that is explained in detail in the game manual part one. And the ranking points get used to tie as a tiebreaker when you have the right. same qualification yes. points. Um, and those points then accumulate over the fir first two scrimmages, and then I. Uh, uh, this may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that then the uh, elimination matches on the day of interleague then also add to that. So then you get the total total ranking for the line selection. I think the idea is that every team should have played 15 matches by then, mm -hmm. um, five at each event. But sometimes you'll have to play an extra match because there's not the right amount of teams. Yep. Other questions? Awesome. Thanks for coming.